First, I have to apologise that the project leader for the restoration is um, Tony Fraser. Unfortunately, can't be here this evening. So I think what we'd like to do is, I'd like to tell you about the history of the machine and why we actually started to uh, think we could actually restore the machine to working order. Uh, how we found all the information we needed to get to that point. And talk about the restoration progress uh, at the moment, what's happening with the machine. And then uh, we'll be persuaded Pete to talk about the memories of using the machine here. And also, some of the challenges you perhaps want to uh, simulate the yeah. machine. Well, that's a feature talk, actually. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and the details don't be later. I will um, It's not a strict formal lecture. There's so many little stories about the machine. Um, so I, I think I'll keep breaking off and telling you some of the anecdotes as well. I, I've sort of learned after looking, um, looking into the machine. I must explain that um, I grew up in a big city just down the road um, in Birmingham and spent every, pretty well every Saturday afternoon for about, it must be most of the 70s, at the Birmingham Science Museum. And I remember the witch arriving. I not whether I knew it was the witch, whether I quite knew exactly what it was, but it was big and impressive and I remember the arrival. So it's always been at the back of my mind that this machine was out there. And it has, been, it has been documented over the years a couple of times, uh, briefly. Um, so there was a bit, of a bit of a hope that we could actually find this machine and, um, and write up the history. And I think that was his, the original goal, just to write up the history of the machine. I, I need to take you back to just the end of the Second World War first, and just give you a bit of background of what actually what was happening at Harbour at the time. Um, I will also switch between calling the Harwell computer, the Harwell Decatron computer, and the Witch computer almost randomly. Um, it's, it was originally known as the Harwell computer when they only had one, very easy. And when they got the second machine, uh, this was, became known as the Harwell Decatron computer, and of course it became known as Witch when it came here. But um, Harwell, oh, reminds me as well. We have a short film as well. The BBC kind of recorded the machine coming out of storage and arriving in pieces at the museum as well. And it's about three or four minutes, and uh, we'll look at that after the point um, First of all, atomic energy in World War II. Um, and there obviously may well be people in the audience know much more about this. But the bulk of the fundamental research in nuclear fission, fission happened in either the UK or Europe. Uh, in, the, in the UK, the project went by the code name the Tube Alloys Project. Now we shipped off all our information and most of our people who were involved in that development to the US, uh, to Los Alamos for the um, Manhattan Project. And that was really the start of what we call now the special relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill in exchange for us shipping all of this knowledge, information, research that we've done, a bunch of it down at Birmingham University as well, off to the States, there's an agreement after the war, all the technology and all the understanding on nuclear fission for both civil engineering and for weapon production would be shared by the Americans back to the UK. All well and good. Unfortunately, post World War II, We've got the Labour government here with Attlee and Truman in charge over the White House. And when the UK goes and knocks on the door of the White House and said, all this information you're going to share with us, the Americans have lost the agreement and refused to share any information at all. No, um, and in fact, down in 46, um, they legislated the McMahon Act which actually said that any information, any information in the US about nuclear fission, weapon production, civil engineering, and power production, was actually, quote, born secret, that it could never actually be released out of the US. So we'd given up absolutely everything at that point, the Americans. Um, and in 1945, a, a very, very small government uh, committee, cabinet committee, the prime minister and just two others, Agreed that in fact the UK would have to therefore go up, do it, you know, go, 
go it alone and actually develop their own program. Uh, primarily, despite what was, uh, nothing, nothing was said about this at all, absolutely nothing at all. All the minutes of the meeting apparently were all sort of destroyed as well afterwards, this cabinet meeting. And the cabinet meeting went by the name the code Gen 75. And they agreed at that point that they would, have, they would actually develop their own nuclear weapons program. Only Stephen at the time, the Foreign Secretary, was actually no, uh, was, was quoted as saying, we must have this thing here, banging the table, and if necessary, the bloody Union Jack on the top of it. Um, and in 1963, another small uh, manager, uh, cabinet committee decided to actually, you know, that, that this would be ratified and production would grow. Uh, I'll explain how it grew in a moment. Um, nothing was ever mentioned uh, at all about the UK producing nuclear weapons until a very, very offhand comment in 48, uh, mentioned in Parliament. But up to that point, absolutely everything was secret about this. The, so post World War II, as I said, it's goodbye, Uncle Sam. Um, now I was, I was, I must say, I was shocked about some of this. I, I'm not so naive that I thought the end of World War II would be over and it would be happy days here again and everything would be rosy. But obviously the UK was in absolute desperate financial straits at that point, not helped by the Americans at all. They were rather over a barrel, and in fact for actually getting martial aid support, uh, we had to give up all of our, nearly all of our um, holdings of uranium. But of the uranium was coming from the African continent where we had um, you know, the empire, and all of that was given up in exchange for actually getting cash out of the Americans, and in exchange for the Ameri uh, to stop the Americans beating us up over exchange controls. A pretty dire situation. So the UK went alone with four big centres, um, Harwell for research and development, and it's Harwell that you always hear about, because Harwell could be talked about to people. It was a centre for research development and ostensibly for civil engineering and for power production. Um, the other two big, big centres, big research centres as well, were Springfield, for actually processing uh, fuel, Cape and Hurst for enriching it, and the big production uh, plutonium plants at Winsco. They're very, very rarely talked about, but Harwell uh, was talked about generally. I've got some information on the front here. Quite a few sort of publications were produced exactly about the work that was happening in our world. Um, so we were all on our own at that point. And the search began to actually find a research centre, somewhere to actually work. Um, the intention and was always to build a research centre over near Cambridge University. Um, an RAF base was ideal because of ready built huge hangars, um, sometimes accommodation blocks as well, uh, and also needed a sort of water supply. However, the RAF were not happy about giving up any bases in East Anglia at all with a threat from the uh, Soviet Union. So they weren't available. But the RAF did offer RAF Harwell near Oxford. Um, it was the first, it was the first of this of a batch of group of 61, 66 airfields planned before uh, World War II. It's a big Mark I as an RAF base. Its uh, runway was actually over a hill. So when you took off on the runway, you couldn't actually see the end of the runway. <laughs> so if a whole batch of people are actually taking off, to, uh, I don't know the terms, if a whole group of people taking off together, you rather assume that the guy in front of you had actually taken off and gone. If you didn't, you could ditch the plane off the side of the runway. Because at, at the end of the runway, if you didn't manage to take off or ditch it, was the ammunition dump. <laughs> so it runs from concentrated of the mine, really. Um, it was a bit Mark I, but um, it was available, made available to, um, to John Cockcroft. And in the visitor's book, Harlow at Harlow, he actually visited to actually survey the site on the 30th of water. Uh, October 45, and his notes separately in his diary reports a very frosty reception. The actual base uh, com uh, commander wouldn't show him around, and it was left for a, um, a 
police, uh, military police to show him around, and no one would have anything to do with him at all. But they chose RAF Harbour. Now, the work that was done there is just actually unbelievable. The amount of money that was spent was unbelievable as well. The amount of money that was spent at Harwell in those five years for from 15, 45 to 50, each one, each year, exceeded all the expenditure of all the universities for further education in the UK. Huge amounts of money was spent there. Uh, it was a pretty desperate time. 42 to 47 was this awful winter and snow for a long, long time. This is described, everybody that worked at Harwell and I've interviewed, their first memory of getting to Harwell was the mud. Mud everywhere, they were constantly building roads and, and um, digging trenches. And this is the, um, the chimney in the middle there. It's the highest, was the highest chimney at the time in the UK. And it was for venting the hot air from one of the reactors, the second reactor they built. So the, the second reactor was called BEPO. It's an air-cooled reactor that needed five tons of air blown through it every minute to keep it cool. Not used for production, just used for research. And the five tons of air were blown up this chimney. Now when the actual fans was first switched on, this was tested, they actually realised and found out that they actually built the biggest organ pipe in the UK. <laughs> you could hear the boom this as far away as Reading and certainly in Oxford. So there's some work was actually done to add extra bricks um, and, and structures inside the chimney to actually break up the standing wave. But this, this, this is people working, um, 5,000 people working there um, and inventing the science as they go along. Quite an amazing time. Um, the other story about the chimney is in the, a letter in the local paper. Um, that so they grew at the village, at the Harbour village itself, was somebody complaining about all the mess and the lorries going back to forth to Harbour. And the comment was something like, well, they obviously don't do any work there, they don't build anything there, I've never seen smoke on that bloody chimney. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm grateful that in fact nobody ever did see smoke on that chimney actually. You know, problem otherwise. Um, but the work was quite phenomenal. Uh, the other machine, the first reactor they produced, the Gleep reactor, it's about the size of a four bedrooms with a detached house. It was built in 46, but actually only finally shut down in 1990. It actually became sort of the reference reactor for neutron sources and was adopted by the National Physical Laboratory. Um, it's been completely dismantled. There is absolutely nothing left of our work at all. It's a desperate show. Um, to my mind, that's the sort of thing that should be listed in the nuclear reactor. It's, it's a desperate loss. Um, but, we're going to come to All of the work that was done uh, all the mathematical work, all the computing work that was done at Harvard at the time was, do, was done by groups of graduates, young graduates. And there were teams, teams of about six, and there were three or four teams working away. The only information they got were mechanical calculators. Um, some talk about a couple of people having the electrically operated one, but that just means it's a motor rather than have to crank the handle. But it was a mechanical calculator. And mathematical tables, like the one you see in the background, um, the bulk of the tables that they used came from the American Mathematical Tables Project. And if anyone's ever interested, just do a quick Google search. Um, they came out of the American WPA program, the workers' program, to actually uh, generate employment in the US. And they had huge teams of computers, of, of people, sitting there with hand calculators, cranking these tables out. Um, but very, very structured, so you have one team which only did arithmetic. Write a lot that did multiplication, and there's other people that did division, and they would actually crank these tables out. And these tables, um, I've got one set, there are entire libraries of them, but huge books of these tables. Um, and that's sort of that with a mechanical calculator is all they actually had. 
to model some of these um, machines that they were building. So no electronic computers there, no uh, you know, any, um, anything more complicated than a mechanical calculator like that. If I just show you what was going on at the time as well, just to put this in context, um, you can barely read the dates at the top there, but the Manchester Baby had um, Forty-six. Forty-six. Um, was being designed um, and operational in forty-eight. Um, just slightly later on, the Cambridge EdSat machine. So the Manchester Baby was the first store program computer, and the, the Cambridge EdSat machine was sort of production uh, resource for the, the university itself. Um, an interesting machine, an American machine, something called the Selective Sequence Electronic Calculator. Uh, it's a huge machine that was built by IBM. Uh, relay based and electronic using paper tape, much like the, uh, the Witch computer, um, on a sort of massive scale. No, no evidence particularly that actually led to any, uh, any influence on the Harwell machine. But the guys from Harwell regularly went over to Cambridge to look at the EdSat machine when they were thinking about their design. A quick who's who um, at Harwell at the time. Sir John Cockcroft in charge. The head of theoretical physics at the time, a chap with pen flavors a bit later on, was Klaus Fuchs. Now, Klaus Fuchs had worked on the Manhattan Project in the <coughs> US and was very, very highly placed in the Manhattan Project. Most of the work uh, at Los Alamos was, was compartmentalized. So if you didn't need to know, you didn't know. So nobody really had an idea of the whole process. But Klaus Fuchs did understand the whole business that was going on there. And he kept absolutely voluminous notes of everything that happened every day that happened. Now, it was only later found out that the reason he was doing this, he was making copies and sending it to his Russian Paymasters. But he was keeping those notes. So when Harwell started, it was generally thought that if we didn't actually understand anything, we didn't actually know how to make something, then Klaus Fuchs would generally know that he would go home and refer to his notes, which he still had, um, and come in the next day with the answer. So despite the fact there was no help from the Americans at all, it's ironic that this chapter was spying all the Americans all this time actually kept us going. Um, the electronics division, led by Dennis Taylor, uh, the bulk of the work was done by one of our designers, a chap called Ted Cookiaro, who um, is, it was, and he's still quite a character, and didn't really take too much notice of what the directors of Harvard were saying. And Ted thought it was a good idea, and he could get away with it, he would do it. Um, Ted's team, Ted McGarber, Dick Barnes, and Gurney Thomas, I'm pleased to say they're absolutely all still with us and welcome on some photos a bit later on. But we need to remember Klaus Fuchs. Um, the guys in the electronic division and Klaus Fuchs and Jack Howlett, who was in charge of these uh, young graduates working with these mechanical calculators, would desperately anxious about the fact that Harwell was, was uh, recruiting very bright young graduates looking for an exciting job in, in nuclear engineering and atomic power were plonked with a set of these tables and a mechanical calculator and for weeks on end grinding out these, these, these calculations. So there was uh, very much a desire to actually do something better and actually re uh, and build a machine to replace those hand computers. And it literally a chance conversation with John Tate from the theoretical physics group who was describing this problem to one member of the actual electronics division that this was such a waste of resources that they had these, so, these bright young people doing this that the electronics division thought, well, and I quote, how complicated can it be? Um, now, they had, they 
visited Cambridge on at least two occasions. They've done some research. They've been able to see uh, some Morris Wilms over in Cambridge and looked at what was happening on EdSAC. I think deciding, in fact, that that was probably a bit of a, too much of a jump and they wanted to do something simpler. They came up with a cake with their design for the computer, not ever to be the fastest all singing dance, dancing computer, but just to replace those group of six people that would sit there with these mechanical calculators. And they put together a presentation uh, and a costing and took that to the head of theoretical physics, Klaus Fuchs, and to John Cockcroft, expecting a real battle of this um, because it was completely off their work program. It was out of the blue. It's not something that you would necessarily be able to persuade anyone to do. They spent about 10 minutes starting this presentation and then were interrupted by Sir John Cockcroft and said, are you sure you can do it? Said, yes. So said, well, go away and do it then. Don't bother us anymore. What actually happened was that morning, Sir John Cockcroft had been told that Klaus Fuchs had actually admitted to spying for the Russians. So you can imagine a situation where you've got uh, my three guys, my designers at the front, doing a whole song and dance about this computer. You've got Klaus Fuchs, who is about to be, well, if he's not going to be hanged, he's going to be sent back to, he's going to, be sent to Russia. And John Cockcroft, sitting next to his most senior person in the whole hardware organization that had been spying for Russia at this time. So um, it went through on the nod. They got permission to actually do this. And they started construction in early 1950, uh, and had really completed the, the construction by April 51, with this is very, it isn't very quality, it's a very early picture of the machine. Um, now you've got the picture of the front, which you might be able to see. At that point, there are only two stores. They'd only built two stores to actually prove the machine was working. And that was enough for them to actually uh, debug the machine um, and thoroughly test it. Now, quick description of what's in the machine. The, uh, all of the paper, all of the programs prepared for the machine were prepared on paper tape. There are um, something like eight, seven paper tape readers in the machine. Handbook was either on paper tape or the printer as well. The, um, I'll leave this up at the end actually as well when Peter's talking about the machine. Um, and I think um, Mary said a, a, a short while ago you wouldn't be running Java on this. Well, you certainly, you certainly wouldn't. You wouldn't be running assembler either. This is very, very low level machine code. Um, in fact, I can show you a little bit of the code. This is the order code for the machine. Um, because of its role, because of its job as, as producing these mathematical tables, it's got hardware multiply and hardware divide actually you know, built into the hardware, which is relatively unusual. Um, it's fairly complete in the sense that there are conditional jumps that you can actually, on, on the basis of a previous calculation, make a jump conditional on that, on, on that result or conditional on the store. Um, notice, noticeable for the absence, no logical operators that we'd expect, like um, um, exclusive or and and so on. But very much to uh, cut down just to do that particular job. And the way it was programmed, Say all on paper tape. Typically, you would, and people cover some of this as well. First job you need to do on a machine like this when you switched it on is all the stores contain apparently random information. So the first job is to clear the stores that you're going to use. So when the machine started, you'd have a loop of tape or a short piece of tape on the on the first tape reader to clear those machines, to clear those stores, and initialize the machine. Um, you're, when we talked about transferring control to different parts of the program, you're transferring control to different paper tape readers. 
So we do just as the bootstrap jumps into this first paper tape and executes those instructions. The last thing we're doing there is uh, transferring control to paper tape two. So that reader stops, and paper tape reader two starts. Now paper tape reader two has a loop, and literally it's a loop of tape. The program we punch on the tape, then glued, put into the reader. So paper tape on two. We'll loop around, I think it's just producing a table of, of, of squares. Okay, that will loop around something like five times, and eventually that conditional instruction at the end of paper tape two will either stop or stop the machine or loop back to the start again. So for just this simple program, we're just printing the table, the, the, uh, 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 a table of squares, we've got the initialization program on one reader, we've got some raw data coming from paper tape reader three, and the basic loop of the program uh, on uh, tape reader 2. Now, a loop of program like that, and that loop of program would be probably about that sort of size. So that would go through the reader five times. That would be fine. The readers, electromechanical readers, feel the tape by banging pins against the tape. And if you do that enough times, eventually you bang your way through the tape. So eventually, this tape going round. It's completely covered in holes. And there are all sorts of clever techniques to actually avoid this. Um, if it's a particularly important program, you could actually uh, punch it onto linear tape, which would last that much longer. You can also uh, fool the machine slightly by repeating that section of code, that block of code, many, many times down the tape. So you could have a tape from here to the side of the auditorium, the same program on. So that little loop only gets executed uh, less often than tape lasts longer. Um, you can only imagine with eight readers and eight huge loops of tape, the sort of festoon of tape going in and out of this machine is phenomenal. Now, it's, it was handed over to the computers people that are uh, working in Cloudspring's team in, in May 52. And this so lady called Pamela, it was Pamela uh, Dyson at the time, was one of those computers. She'd gone to Cambridge as a graduate and been working, cranking out these things. And I think they were a bit dubious about this, this huge machine, whether it would actually do the job. But uh, Pamela was given the role of actually testing the machine. So she'd work through a job, a report, um, and also they compare it with the results from the machine. Um, she talks here about using a handout table with a WPA tables, these huge bound tables. And this monster of uh, paper tape readers built of Meccano. Now they do look as if they're built of Meccano, but I assume they're actually not. Um, but a little bit might be like it. And typical of the uh, applications that they would produce would be, produce, would be to produce mathematical tables that weren't available from, from other sources. So this table uh, would be typical that would be printed out from the machine at Harlow, which is to solve the differential equation. Now, I said their goal was never to make it the fastest machine in the world. For this table, there are, what's that, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, there's 30 or 35 lines on there. Each line of that would take the machine five minutes to calculate. Now, everybody made the point uh, 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 that I've spoken to that it was an incredibly reliable machine. And there's a certain case to say, well, it almost had to be, to be honest. Because typically, a program like this at Harvard would be loaded up and left to run overnight. Uh, and you collect off the printer the next morning that, that table. Um, the design of the machine is such that if there's a master program uh, on a tape, you can concatenate tapes together. So the whole stream of work to actually put through the machine to keep it busy overnight. Famously, the chap that's in charge was in charge of the computers there, a chap called Bart Fossey. And he settled down by the machine. Bart Fossey was very good and very quick. And settled down next to the machine to actually start a race. Kept going for about half an hour. 
flat out and then gave up. Um, Bob Fossey's the chap on the left, which um, Peter thought you might remove. Sorry. No, he's, be, he's still got the beard, the beard's white now. Um, but uh, I think he actually did really quite well to keep going for half an hour. But I suppose said the machine just planned on. It was incredibly reliable. Um, from that period of 52 to 53, when it was before the, paper, before the first paper of the Mac machine was produced, running 80 hours a week, 55% um, of the total available time, and that's 24 hours a day. So um, I think it was really quite, um, really quite successful. The five-week pause due to damage was interesting, and um, it took quite a bit of digging. There were quite a few embarrassed pauses when I asked about this. And the machine, uh, if you see it could be, it's about six, seven foot high. And all of the panels on the machine can actually be lifted on and clipped into place. They're quite heavy though. Well, chuck in charge of the machine, and that at this point was Ted Gukio Opera, was head of electronics by this stage, um, was a bit of a maverick, and once you'd actually test some ideas on the machine, so on his own one night, decided to take all the store units off, particularly with this idea of putting it back. And he's on the ladders behind the machine trying to take the store unit off, slipped and dropped the whole store onto the ground. <laughs> now, when I was explaining it, I was, I, was, I was told this story. There's three gentlemen now, this is to Gurney Thomas, Ted Kugar, and Dick Bond. Ted quietly explained to me what had happened. And these other two gentlemen, they're both 80s, they're in fits of giggles at this, actually. And apparently, it was never spoken about at the Harlem. This had happened, but no one we ever talked about it. But um, obviously, Ted was very embarrassed about it. Um, again, it's in the line from um, Jack Haller, who's in charge of sort of, uh, in charge of theoretical physics on this stage. Um, it took little power to operate. Um, as I said, programs could be concatenated together on the master tape. So they would actually leave it with miles and miles of tape. And I think it was over a Chris, yes, Christmas New Year period where it sat and operated for 10 days continuously. A lot of the data that they were, as well as producing these tables, um, lots of the equipment that was monitoring experiments at Harvard would actually punch out the results. So if you're typically monitoring a, a half-life, you'd punch out a count every minute or so. So the equipment itself would generate miles of paper tape. So quite often that was used as sort of source data for the machine. Um, one of the reasons it was so uh, reliable is that there were built-in systems within the machine to detect errors, and to detect errors and try again, to almost back out of the operation and repeat the operation again. And then, it, in fact, it, the, the number of lives it was called. And after three lives, the program would actually give up and then transfer control to the next um, <coughs> job on the master paper tape. So you could actually leave it for that long. It's not like um, it's not like starting something up on your PC and then going to bed and realizing it stopped five minutes after you got to bed. This would actually carry on quite some time. Uh, by 57, Oh well, uh, machine with its charmed life and its first retirement. Uh, the guys, the same guys that built the Harvard machine, had built um, their experience from that machine. Had built a transistorized machine known as the Cadet. Cadet was really the first completely transistorized machine in the UK. There had been similar machines, but they're not completely transistorized. And this used a small magnetic drum and, and punch cards. Uh, they'd also then, of course, buy commercial buy systems off the shelf for commercial <coughs> systems. And at that stage, um, the bulk of the money and resources were going into their, um, their relations for uh, colleagues down the road at Aldermass and eight of eight of the, uh, the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment at Aldermass. And Harwell began to rely on machines from old master more and more. So the machine has its first retirement, which is of course good news for us all. Because 
chap called John Hammersley. John Hammersley uh, had worked um, at Harvard uh, on secondment from Oxford. And John Hammersley was, uh, had written programs for the machine, was very fond of the machine, and was quite determined it wouldn't simply be scrapped. He encouraged the Oxford Mathematical Institute to actually organize the competition for the machine. Now, um, again, another sort of side story that John Hammersley was absolutely passionate about, about teaching mathematics. And I went to all of John Hammersley's papers, hopefully looking for references to the Harvard machine. And I found one paper with one title which uh, it's worth sharing, but it probably uh, still rings true. And that was the title of his paper. <laughs> <laughs> You can imagine, uh, you know, we really need to be much further than that. Uh, but John, John organised a competition. There were, oh, there were 30 submissions um, from different, or from further um, education establishments. 30 submissions. There was a short list of nine produced, and the nine colleges all went down to um, to Harvard to make their presentation. Now the guys at Harvard remember that um, it wasn't just the college, in many cases it was the local mayor as well. So they were welcoming some civic dignitaries with all their chains and, and regalia. Um, but of course the winners, as we know, was Wolverhampton and Staffordshire College of Technology. Um, somebody like me to research the history of the machine, this was an absolute blessing because Almost everything that then happened to the machine got into the Wolverhampton Express and stuff. <laughs> so it's very easy to go there and, and flick through all of these papers. Uh, now it's just difficult to read some of that, but I've pulled some of the um, some paragraphs out. Uh, we are very proud of ourselves today, perhaps we should be. Um, part of their submission was also that they would actually share time on the machine with local industry. Um, and some local industry also contributed to uh, the purchase of the machine, certainly moving it from Harwell. Harwells um, weren't able to offer any help at all. It was simply, it's here, you need to collect it, take it away, get it working. Um, so, Chubb certainly actually also funded some of the moving machine. I'm not desperately sure, perhaps people might be able to remember more, that the college actually quite knew what they were getting. Uh, there's a comment there about it can, for instance, work out wage calculations much uh, much more quickly than human beings. But well, I think really couldn't as a phrase, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not at all. Um, the other interesting comparison is that the only comparable com uh, commercial machine, Pegasus, would have cost the college fifty to sixty thousand pounds, which has just been completely out of the question. So that's that, that's that, that's that, that time. At that time. Yeah. Yeah, which would have been just quote out the address and start an article. It must be right. <laughs> <laughs> it's who, who quote was that quote from? Is that um, principal that's wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um <coughs> bulk of the arguments talk about it as the electronic brain at that point. It's quite common that anything you read in the newspapers at that point about computers always refer to as electronic brains. But um, the college won. Which is, which is absolutely fantastic to use. Another press cutting here, and I think that's that's Cecil Rams bottom on the left of the pot. Again, I think Cecil wasn't shy. <coughs> In talking about the machine and yeah, getting the press. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> I'd like to say a bit stroker as well. At every opportunity, got the press in and talked about the machine, um, which, which again is, 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 is terrific for, for, for those of us researching the machine. And, and I believe the first undergraduate course in computer technology was taught here in '65 with the machine, which is uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, I can't read, I can't remember who the guy is on the right. Um, the other nice thing about all of these pictures as well is that certain modifications were made to the machine while it was here. And by examining the pictures, we can date some of the modifications, which is, which is good for us, certainly. 
other thing is Ray Waldridge actually produced a book on the machine, uh, which is a copy here, primarily about numerical analysis, but there's a really good section at the back about programming with computer. Um, I'm actually remarkably easy to, to, to come across. Um, I've become a big fan of buying second-hand books off the internet now. And just typing in those details, I actually found several copies of the book. Now, I know we'll leave Peter to talk about some of this later on. The Chubb key problem. Now, this is the picture that's down yeah. here at the start. The caption, the caption in the, in the Express the Star, this picture, talked about Frank Hawley on the right, as one of the lecturers here, and on the left, schoolboy Peter Byrne, who was waiting to go up to Cambridge. And I can't, the date 1961. So we started, uh, I think, well, actually, in that case, I bet we could probably find Peter Byrne. And we had got as far as um, the Cambridge Alumni Association tracking Peter down. And, and I think Dan, one of my colleagues from the Community Conservation Society, met Mary at the meeting. Yes, yes, Congress. And, 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 and we found Peter. Um, Peter can tell you a bit more of a story about, um, I think in 1961, perhaps thought he'd seen the back of the machine, but that wasn't quite to believe. Uh, I think, the, I, I see, from my research, I think this picture was taken uh, during Commonwealth, Commonwealth Technical Training Week here, yes. which is the museum. It was a sort of like open day for uh, what we call it, Cal, the chairman of the technical training. Uh, <coughs> now, we're approaching 10 years of the college now, and it was a 10 year anniversary dinner. Um, and again, also made the paper with um, two of the original designers coming back um, to see the machine. And as an aside, we, Harwell had lost one of the designers at that point. Um, Harwell, when, when the first uh, UK atom bomb test went off um, in um, Australia, um, Gilbert came clean and explained what Harwell was about. An awful lot of people in Harwell actually left. Uh, Gurney Thomas, who wasn't at that point, was um, a Quaker and felt he couldn't actually work there anymore. So they lost an awful lot of people at that point. Um, but Temple Yarbrough and Dick Barnes came back to the um, celebration. I think you can read the, uh, the program of events. It's, it's Welcome to the Coven, I'm married at which it's a bit... Uh, <laughs> I think it was probably a very good day, actually. I think it was excellent. That was in 1967. And of course, I'm going to press the star again. And by 73, it's the machine's second retirement. Um, and again, another section from... Uh, Yes, this is from the Express to start. By this point, the college had got an IBM machine and an ICL 1903 a I think it was. Um, but the IBM machine played a tune, apparently. You can't imagine what he actually did. And the ICL 1903, or particularly the line printer, produced some artwork for the day as well. But the other thing that Cecil did at the time, Sir Ron Thompson did, was have the machine listed in the Guinness Book of Records at that stage was known as Guinness Superlatives. Um, and that was in 1973, it's the world's most durable computer. And that listing still stands. It's a bit of a struggle getting anything out of the Guinness Book of Records unless you want to sit up to your neck in baked beans for 20 years or something like that. But you can actually find, if you dig deep enough with them, they will tell you that it's, uh, it's still in their records, it's still um, you know, on the books, and it hasn't, hasn't been um, Challenged at all, and it's in 1973 issue. The other thing that uh, isn't shown, not shown on there, just around the bottom, also had a very nice photograph produced with the name from the machine, which name plate, 
and the key will be used in the frame set. Um, and it's, uh, we, we have a picture of, uh, of, of a picture of the picture with this key, in it, which is really frustrating because I'm jumping the gun. When we talk about the restoration, one of the things we hadn't got the key, we hadn't got was the key to switch it on. <laughs> but luckily that was solved. I'm just going to that uh, but again, part of the charm life is that the machine actually didn't go in, uh, wasn't scrapped, wasn't, wasn't dismantled. And then went to the Birmingham Science Museum, Birmingham Museum of Science and Industry. Now, this isn't a very flattering picture of the Science Museum. This was the main entrance on Newhall Street in Birmingham. It was absolutely a fantastic place. Absolutely, I mean, exactly what the museum should be. Absolutely amazing. Went to the Science Museum, it was on display from 73 until apparently from 1997. Um, now, I don't have any pictures at all. I, I've been through all the records I, I can find that the um, Science Museum kept. I can't find any pictures of the, the machines and the gallery. But just in case anybody does remember the old Science Museum, the picture at the bottom was just as you came into the main entrance, from the main entrance, and it was the big steam um, yeah. engine hall. Upstairs in this gallery, I think all the roofs be taken out. Part, uh, I can't remember what was on one side, the other side had a big model Magnox nuclear reactor. The Fox and Geese machine behind it, the Witch machine was there. Um, but unfortunately, that, that, sadly, that's all gone at the Science Museum. But um, a group of um, photographers and sort of enthusiasts got into the building, let's just leave it at that somehow, <laughs> and took photographs um, in 2006. Now, the next, I suppose, sighting of the machine was in uh, 2002. So, the, the Science Museum closed in 1997, and I think there are probably still bits of the building, but the bulk of it has obviously all gone now. Everything that came out of the museum went to the original Birmingham Museum's Collection Centre in Charlotte Street, in, near Birmingham, well, in Birmingham City Centre. And one of my colleagues from the Computer Conservation Society, Chris Burton, was visiting the, computer, the collection centre about a completely different machine, took quite a few photographs, and there are sections of the machine there, and you can, if you just imagine that there's nothing, all the units have been taken off the racks, and you can just see the control panel there. It was in pretty, a pretty sorry state. Um, it wasn't... Um, an ideal situation. It wasn't a perfect museum collection centre uh, at all. Um, quite damp with everything else. But the machine was there, and it, it sort of it's right around sitting in a packing case at the moment. Next sighting, and this is when I pretty well when I started my in anger, let's try and find this machine and find out where it is. Uh, by this stage, Birmingham Museums had opened uh, a new collection centre, again um, just off the city centre of Dolphin Street, which is an absolutely fantastic place, absolutely bone dry, air conditioned, everything that you can possibly imagine. Uh, it is actually also open about two or three times a year, uh, and you have to actually look on their website for research for it, but it's, it's a terrific place to go around. Everything, few of the items like this are actually um, positions that you can look around them. But the bulk items that, that, that they brought down off um, of huge sort of, um, racking shelving is definitely worth looking around. There isn't a, a slight aside here. I was born near um, Aston Cross in Birmingham, just down the road from the HP Source Factory. And if you see on the bottom there in front of that road, the like source, that's the source that came off the side of the HP Source Factory. Um, now, the, the, the museum collection centre certainly now has a display and look after cars. As far as computing is more concerned, uh, it was a bit more uh, unmanaged. Now, uh, I'm not going to pick out particular items here, but there are some absolute gems. This, this machine in the front, um, an Orion console from the Metal Box Company in Worcester. But if you can see, I think it's 
see right at the back, the letter C on the wall, just to the right of that, you can see three going, that's the, the first site we had of the Wiki computer. Um, now, to get to that, everything else had to be moved out, finally. Uh, I have got some pictures, but it was, in, it was in a fairly sorry state. It had been reassembled almost, almost randomly. Certainly, I can just lie on the floor. And at that point, we, we found the, the, the core of the computer, but none of the peripherals, none of the paper tape that we used. But I mean, it was just overjoyed that we found that much. Um, and of course, because we found that much, then the project takes a bit of a turn because initially it was just going to be research. Let's find out actually what, let's document this machine and what actually happened to it. But of course, when you found this much of it, uh, the back there, we then started thinking seriously about the restoration. Have we, have we found all of the parts or a sufficient number of parts? If we found the bulk of the computer but not the paper tape readers, we might have been able to use alternatives. Did we have any access to the manuals or diagrams of the machine? Were, were there any actually ever, ever saved? Um, that probably, even though know, the original designers or, or anybody that had used the machine was still with us. Um, even if all of that was available, did we have any need to actually resort to, to, to actually restore the machine in terms of space to do it and the resources and the people and, and the money to do it? And also, if we do this, what was the eventual plan? What are we going to do with the machine we've done? It? And there's a question about whether we should actually attend the project. Now, of course, the Computer Conservation Society has a long history of similar projects. So we understood some of the questions. Uh, one of the things that persuaded us, or yes, persuaded it was possible, is we found the core of the machine at the collection centre. The guys that look after the collection centre said, point about us here at the collection centre. We don't know anything about computers really, but we look after things and we will never lose things. We can't find them, but we know <laughs> that they're lost. They can't be lost. So the, um, the collection centre is laid out with long racks about three times the length of this room on six levels high, going up to, well, so high. Um, half as high again as this, this room. So we put one of our guys, who's actually the project manager of the team, our friendly Fraser, on the front of a forklift truck <laughs> hanging on with one man. And he was driven all the way down that aisle. Then went up three feet, four feet, and driven all the way back again. And then again, and again. And there are ten rows. And did all of this. But, and literally going and looking at each, each location in this racking, lifting up any covers and saying, that looks like part of it. And I found every single bit at that stage, uh, which is quite amazing. They're all, they were labeled so on, but labeled as, they've been separated from the machine. So things were, um, I can't remember the description, but there were slightly odd descriptions, like a, a paper, a, a paper, I can't remember the precise, it was like a paper tearing machine, but that was one of the actual paper tape uh, readers. So it was all there, but it literally, um, the first day we found the machine, we went back another two, three times, and eventually just going to, uh, on this forklift truck backwards and forwards, actually found absolutely every part of the machine. And to cap it all, we then found in a, in a packing case, a company car this little tray, it's, it's, a, it's a pallet sized tray, which is um, sort of a square, but it's a square. And that contains, what you can see here, but that's actually quite high, and there are multiple levels there. It contains all the spare Decatron tubes that all the have been given to the market. Spare valves, spare relays, um, boxes of paper tape at the top right there, the original programs, uh, ribbons for the printers. I think we've taken them off at this point. All the original diagrams, the circuit diagrams and theory of operation that Harwell had produced, and also supplements that have been produced here. Um, and that, I think by, that, by the time we realised that, I mean, we found that, we thought, well, this is just, just too good, this is too good an opportunity not to go ahead. Um, 
we, not, we haven't actually spoken to anybody at this point who had used the machine. Uh, again, a bit more research and contact to the CCS and, and to the VCS, and particularly now that the late to Peter Hall, we managed to contact Ted Cook Yarbrough. Ted Cook Yarbrough is the other gentleman on the left, um, standing above his Dick Barnes, the two original designers, and the chap on the right is Tony Fraser, who was responsible for the restoration of the machine. And we went to see, we, we gathered all the material we had, went down to see the two of them, who lived not far from Harvard still, and presented them all of this information. And they were absolutely overwhelmed. I mean, and if, we were, if we weren't sure about whether to, to, to attempt this at that point, I think talking to these guys persuaded us that we had to actually do this. And they'd be, um, you might have probably an idea that Ted's fairly frail, Ted's the most senior of the guys. Uh, Dick, studying at the past, he's an absolute enthusiast. It's as much as we can do to stop him coming to the museum every day. <laughs> uh, the first time he came to the museum, we weren't quite ready. He sent me an email saying, I, he doesn't drive He said, I found out if I get a bus to Oxford, a train to Milton people, something else, and something else, and then walk the rest, I can get to the museum. <laughs> I said, you can God do that, I'll come and pick you up. Um, and, and Ted's been great, actually. Um, one thing I haven't got a picture of, unfortunately, is when we, um, what about the video? When we started to uh, put some of the racks together, we're obviously exaggerating the racks, because there's a lot of damage. <clears throat> the back of one of the racks is signed by the three designers. We signed that and dated that when it was assembled the first time we to the program was at um, Harbour. So we've met pretty well everybody. I, it, as well, um, I talked about um, identifying Peter from the uh, article in the Express and Star. Again, Peter was very helpful. Uh, Peter, these guys, I must say, never actually program the machine, of course, the designers. The moment it was working, they wanted something more exciting. The first few transistors arrived from the US, um, partly because um, Ted Cugabra went to Bell Labs and pinched through, <laughs> which he admitted to, more than that. So they wanted more exciting things. Um, but talking to Peter was terrific, because Peter actually remembered using the machine. So we, we, um, it's impossible to actually set up a working party to do this. And the timing actually moved really quite quickly on that stage. We uh, made a proposal to the CCS, the Committee Conservation Society Committee, with all the findings that we had, 14th of May, to get the blessing that we, we, we should go ahead and do this. And I got their blessing, and I probably got the boost fast, because I actually put the proposal in then to the Birmingham Collection Centre the day after, to say, well, it was a detailed proposal about how we wanted to do this, what, our end, what, the, what the goals were, and so on. And they waited to the end of July to come back with an answer, which was absolutely agonizing. Uh, at the end of July, they, they, they agreed that um, we could actually do this, that we could take them with the, uh, all the components of the machine out of the collection center, down to the Museum of Computing of Bletchley in the process. We went back on 24th just to um, effectively put all, all the components of the machine together in the loading bay. Luckily, the Committee Conservation Society uh, awarded, um, made a donation to the, the fund to actually physically move the machine, uh, which you'll see in the video at the moment, which came on the end of August. Uh, now, they collected it on, no, the CCS made the award on the 7th of August. Again, we moved fairly quickly, and the machine was collected and brought to the museum on the 3rd of September. Um, which isn't really that long ago. Um, I just seen that actually reminds me how the, the progress has been made. Um, if I show you the, the, the video, um, Tony Fraser, who you saw um, slides ago, is a project leader of the machine and has a group of five people that work with him. Now, all these people, like all the volunteers at the museum, have got full time jobs. Uh, but Tony manages the whole operation. And luckily, the machine, because it has paper tape equipment, printing equipment, electronics, relays, power supplies. The jobs can actually be divided up. So the progress has been really quite um, remarkable. All the information on the progress, including short videos as well, are on the um, museum website. 
Tony doesn't tell me exactly how far he's got because he knows I'll get all over excited about it and start telling everybody. But I have seen paper tape being read through the paper tape readers. I, I've seen the, the past plays up and working, um, which is fairly ter terrifying for us to pass them. And the basic state generator, the clock of the machine is actually working. Um, so they're really doing quite well. Going back to the power supply, one of the things we hadn't got was the key to actually power the machine up. And of course, you'd always, you always know, we can go around the back and we can hot wire it as well. Um, but luckily, Phil Randolph into the audience came along to see the machine and actually brought this picture, this framed picture with him, with the key inside the picture. So we're actually able to copy the key. So we actually now can operate it properly from the front. Um, right. Bear with me just a second, and um, I will that. Um, I need to start this and then make it full screen, so bear with me just a second. It's a machine from the late 1940s, at the time when there were very, very few computers being developed. Um, this particular machine is important to us because it is the last complete surviving machine from that period. And it's it's intact. I mean, all of it's coming off, sort of off the, the, the line here at the moment. Uh, we've managed to trace, and this has been three years now of doing the research, we've managed to trace all of the components of the machine. It was developed in the early days of Harwell, uh, developing the sort of very first nuclear um, and atomic power stations uh, for the UK. And at that time, all calculations, all mathematical calculations were done by people with mechanical calculators. And it was, some of the calculations would take days and days to do. Um, so this machine was developed not to be the fastest computer in the world at the time, but to be a relentless, reliable machine. Between the power supply and this rack, where's the rack belongs, the, um, where's the memory? What's the memory? We dismantled this very carefully when it was in storage, just so we could move it more easily. Uh, and, and to make sure that we didn't actually damage any of the components. Um, so what we've done at the moment is we assembled it back onto the racks. Um, it's all in the correct place at the moment, so all of the items are actually on there. We haven't obviously had a chance to, to do any testing at all at the moment. We have a limited uh, amount of documentation. We have all the original circuit diagrams, which is of course absolutely fantastic. We have some pictures that were taken both at Harwell when it was built and when it was used at the Hampton College of Technology. And we're looking at those pictures just at this stage to make sure that we're actually counting the number of memory units, the number of relay racks, and we have the actual racks in the right position. Right. I'm pleased to say as well, that as well as documenting all of the restoration process, which you can do on the website, we are recording uh, as much of that as possible as well. Uh, who is actually recording some of the, uh, the work that's happening and, and with the machine. Um, we initially thought about 18 months before we would have the machine operation uh, and actually we're doing really quite well. Um, next year of course is the 60th anniversary of the machine so it would be absolutely perfect to have the machine working then. But I, I, I suspect that really by <clears throat> Certainly by Christmas, we should have the, the bulk of the machine actually working and operation. Um, I really have no idea how I'm doing time-wise. I've probably been long enough. And I'm hoping we persuade Peter to talk about, to fill in some of the gaps of his life at Wolverhampton. <laughs> and um, I would like to use the machine. Yeah. Come on. Uh, you don't know quite where to start on this. It's a fascinating experience. Um, quite a fascinating experience. I think first of all, perhaps a little, little plug from the computer science side. Uh, anybody that talks about the history of computing, sooner or later will end up having arguments about what is really a computer. Uh, store program, Turing complete, and von Neumann, and all sorts of ways for that. The which was a is. 
Uh, it is Turing complete, uh, which is a fancy way of saying it's got conditional loops. Uh, it's also von Neumann model, which means you can use it for stored programs, but in practice you almost always run programs of tables instead. However, one of the other tricks, if you wanted to avoid punching holes in the paper tape, was to store perhaps, the code actually in memory, and read instructions out of memory. But one snag with that, it was actually slow than reading instructions on paper tape, so it wasn't a fact that you can see the best of time. Uh, it wasn't particularly large either, I think you probably saw the side of it, it's got probably 19 memory locations. One other slightly odd feature of it, it uh, used a fixed point notation system, which being the biggest number it could store was 9.99999. The smallest number was minus 9.99. Now that might sound a severe constraint. To me nowadays it does feel really, really awkward if I want to do a you've got some up shoehorn and everything like that. But in those days, when I first used it, this didn't strike me as a problem at all. I'd grown up using a slide rule. Now, there's probably not many people here that have, have used a slide rule now. Well, I've still got mine somewhere. Well, I'm very proud of the slide rule I had at school. A very nice one. Uh, and of course, this only works with the range of, of 1 to 10. And you have to do all the scaling yourself. So we had to do all that. In those days, it didn't strike me as odd. Um, when did I first beat the machine? That was, I think it was November 1960. There was a lecture held here in college uh, for local schools, and we were encouraged to go along and uh, learn all about this. And, uh, I forget who it was that spoke, but they explained the basic machine code to us, and uh, they ushered downstairs to the machine itself, and I typed in my very first computer program. Evaluated each of the X using the first three series terms of the series. Those are not mathematicians, don't worry about that, it's quite a simple little problem. Uh, and then, again, as Kevin said, I, uh, I got a place at a university, and I didn't particularly want to dig holes in roads, I didn't particularly fancy worrying going off on a gap year or anything like that. So said, right, go and amuse yourself at the local tech, play with this computer thing. And they were very keen to get somebody to come play with it, so along with the guy called Mike Ted, who's now Professor Mike Ted at the University of Aberystwyth, uh, we went up there for, for a day a week and we just played with the machine. Uh, in due course, we got an interesting problem to do, go to see if Messrs. Chubb, this is a Chubb key problem, as he mentioned, and I believe we found the original tapes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I have long lost several office moves too many. I have used out the original source code listing. Uh, I want to say a little bit about what it was like to program the machine, and we, we eventually programmed this. We left it running over the weekend. What we were trying to do, oh, my car keys, oh, my car keys, you look at a key, uh, the old-fashioned Morty's key, and you have bits of metal that stick up, bits of metal that don't stick up. Now these clearly match the lock. Uh, there are clearly a number of possible combinations. The things you don't want is one bit of metal sticking up a long way because that's going to be weak. Uh, you don't know uh, where there are other constraints, and they explained to us what the constraints were, and then said, go away and print out a list of all the permissible uh, keys. And this is what we eventually did. There were five different positions uh, that were reflected around the center of the key and the the door. Uh, and we, we eventually got them all printed out. And they were very pleased with that. And that was what we were taking, we were supposedly looking at in the, uh, uh, in the picture there. The copy came in, so I got to hear about this. So what's really interesting, perhaps, is to look back with modern eyes and say a little bit about how do you go about developing a piece of software for a machine like that? Uh, you might think it's going to be totally different than developing software today. And that, in some respects, you'd be right, but in some respects, you'd be wrong, actually. Of course, we didn't have Java. Uh, we didn't have object orientation. We didn't have SQL, we didn't have databases, we didn't have disks, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have gravity or interfaces, we didn't have any of that. We didn't have Visual Basic, fortunately. <laughs> We didn't even have Fortran. We didn't even have a sender. The machine couldn't, could only work with numbers. It was designed, as Kevin said, for doing sort of scientific calculations. Nobody thought about printing out things in letters. Although the Colossus machine had processed alphabetic text information, that was in a completely separate sealed compartment from the point of view of design. So it couldn't handle text information. You couldn't have any form of program translation. You were reduced to programming in machine code. 
you sat down, you said, I want to move a number from location 10 to location 20. And that's sort of how it happened. Well, okay, you're given a problem, and the way it's similar to programming today is you take the problem, you break it down into steps. And you take each of those steps, you have to break it down some more until you reach the stage where you can actually write some code. Well, that's how I do programs. It might be a bit out of, I don't know whether that's how people do it nowadays. So, uh, point and click and things, I don't know. But uh, it was the same thing, only of course you went down into a lot more detail. And eventually you sat down and you ended up with a lot of tacky piece of paper looking like that. I'm sorry, I've got a slide of this. I thought we used to have a camera here, which wasn't exactly happened anymore. And you wrote down the code for one take, there were bits of comments and then some more code with more little bits of comments and things, things like mod delta minus epsilon to store 21, it says, and things, 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 things like that, or things that are mathematical problem. Um, and okay, you eventually ended up with this code. Your next step was to convert it into something the machine would handle, which meant you sat in front of the keyboard perforator and you tapped away like that. Paper tape came out. And you eventually found the paste spot. I remember the paste spot. It was called Glory. It had a red plastic spreader at the top of it. Some of you might remember that you did a bit of that, joined it up at the end, and held it there, and got the stick on it. Glue never ever works for me for some reason. I, I'm just totally antithetic to glue. I can never make things stick together. And the, the sack that supposedly holds the sack out of place in the, in the car, I do about 20 miles before it falls off something. <laughs> um, so, you join in the month and away you went. You went and pressed buttons, clicked the levers, and the program started running. Fine, fine, that sounds quite straightforward. What we do now, we type in the program, press the button, start running, and then something goes wrong. Right, okay. So we're now really talking about, uh, in this context, how you really go about developing programs. Uh, in my experience, about the only program I've ever got right the first time was the first one I ever wrote. Since then, back at the every program I've ever written has had some sort of mistake in it that I had to go away and uh, scratch my head about. So how do we do bug on the witch? Um, now this is different from how you debug that. To me, sometimes I think debugging is something we tend not to teach people very much now. They're taught how to design programs, and if you use these modern design principles, you don't make mistakes. Ha ha. Um, don't believe that. Well, the machine stopped, or the machine has printed the wrong answer. One of the features that Ian uh, didn't mention uh, one of the things you can do on the machine is a little switch on the control panel, and rather than run through the instructions as fast as you like, you can signal steps. This is quite nice. You can do, click that, do the next instruction, next instruction. Even better, if anyone has done any debugging, we'll be saying, okay, yes, yes, fine, single stepping, yes, we've used that. Now, what about um, examining the contents of memory locations? It's the other thing you do when you debug, well, I do anyway. I say, well, what, what's in location uh, data 17 or something like that? You want to know what's in there because you think it's wrong. You just stood in front of the machine. Now, I'm looking at the rows, you can actually see what number was in every memory location. It was beautifully simple. Uh, so you thought, well, okay, there's something wrong, well, what should be in location 17? You went and stood in front of location 17 and looked at it. Or if you were using location sort of 87, you walked halfway across the room, so you look over there, sort of thing. Uh, a big machine, you can see from the picture. So that was quite nice. It was also quite nice at the point of teaching. I mean, you Use it for teaching because again, students could actually see what was going on. You stood in front of the machine, it was nice and slow. Uh, at any stage, you could see what number was in every memory location. And this, was, this was really very, very nice. Even more fun was to watch it do a multiplication or a division. If you want to ask it to do a multiplication, the way it multiplied was by repeated shift and add, shift and add. Uh, Say, what, what called long multiplication? And I can't resist the slide like version. When I started secondary school doing maths, uh, a friend of mine, and me, we met somebody on the way home, we still chatting strangers in those days. Uh, and I said, What are you doing at school? Oh, the maths, we said. He said, Ah, oh, that's long division. And in 
further masses, longer divisions. And you had this idea, as you went further and further up the mathematical value, you did longer and longer divisions and multiplication. <laughs> so, I always remember that wonderful idea, but uh, at which you could actually watch the, the quotient, the product being built up by repeated shifting and adding. You would see all this happening. Similarly with division, you could see it repeatedly subtracting the divisor from the dividend. They carried on doing that until uh, the answer was negative. Then it added it back once, shifted, and then carried on subtracting, counted the number of times it subtracted, and that gave the quotient. And there's one wonderful snack. If you asked it to divide by zero, it never saw a chain, a sign change of dividend. So it just carried on furiously subtracting zero from the dividend to no very great effect. And it doesn't carry on and on. Oh, so you had to watch out for that. Uh, there was no simple test. But the designers had to some extent thought of this because uh, if the machine hadn't read the new instructions from the program tape in a certain period of time, I think it was about 15 minutes or something, uh, an alarm condition arose. And there you would have various possibilities. One was the machine would automatically shut down. So if you left it doing a long calculation and it hit the halt instruction, it would then eventually switch itself off. Nice. Uh, alternatively, you could wait for it to blow a hooter. <laughs> uh, to remind the operator who had now, now, that was by now fallen asleep, waiting for it to do something, that something had gone wrong. Um, other methods of using it to say it was great for them to watch because it was, it was very visual. Uh, and also, nice sound. Uh, Kevin put on the um, mailing list a uh, little video clip that just got the uh, basic console going. Whether it was trying to boom stuff, I'm not quite sure. But the noise of all the relays clacking and clattering was, was, uh, it was also something to seriously experience. And if you tried to take a transistor radio and then listen to the cricket or something, but it was, all you could hear was clack, 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 so, uh, yeah, you could look at it, you could see what was happening, um, you could make it shut down automatically, you could single step. Another feature, which is probably not very different machine done, you could use it interactively. There was a modification, when SIG came from Wolverhampton, there was a further console switch. As uh, Kevin said, there are conditional instructions. You can do something conditionally to remember the sense of that. Uh, you can test the memory location for a positive or a negative. Um, you could also test the setting of a console switch. So you would stand in front of it and it would say, I'm going to test the console switch, and you push it up and push it down, and the machine would then be programmed to do, to do two different things. Uh, so there was an interactive, an interactive capability that I don't know if we ever used it very much, but it, uh, uh, it was uh, one of the interesting pieces of the machine. Um, what, other, uh, what other memories? Yes, of course, yes, I made great groups of tape like everybody else. I have the angle point lamp over there and the tape reader over there. I don't think, I think we only had six tape readers by the time we got to Wolverhampton. Um, okay, you've created your program tape. You've um, realized a mistake in your program tape. What do you do about it? You type out the whole lot again. It's a little bit better than that. You've had a clever little thing called Edit Desk, which I think appeared on the picture. You had two tape readers, and what you did was you put the faulty tape on one reader, a patch that contained the correct bit of code on the other, told the perforating machinery to copy off the first tape reader and stop it just as you got to the back bit, switch the input source to the patch, copy that, manually move the other tape forward, and then carry on. Uh, clearly, you have to be a little bit careful to stop and start the tapes at just the right place. But yes, that's how we that's how we edited programs, uh, and that uh, worked quite nicely too. The machine, incidentally, physically when it first arrived at Wolverhampton, when I first met it, uh, was in uh, I can't remember the room number. It would be in the low 30s, I think, unless I renumbered them all since I was here. Said probably now. Uh, the part of the building that faces St Peter's Church and Wolverhampton Street. Uh, as you go from Wolverhampton Street, uh, the, the building curves round. And the ground floor on that curve was the then Frank Hawley's office. And the machine was actually in his office, believe it or not. Didn't seem to buy having schoolboys taking over his office a day a week, but uh, um, the main machine was there. 
uh, at the back of the wall here, the other side of that wall, the sort of ante room that contained the tape readers and the uh, tape preparation equipment. Uh, the machine was later removed to room 19, and one of the pictures we've seen this evening was taken room 19. Uh, that was that is now more or less part of the arena theatre. Uh, and its final move was to the uh, again I don't know dates as to when it moved around. Uh, was to um, first floor of what of a block over on Stafford Street. In my day, it used to be a computer centre before they built the new thing they built. Uh, and it was in a room next door to the IBM computer called the IBM 1620, it was actually, that's called the play tune. That play tune was rather nicely, actually, it was very fun to uh, have to play tunes. Um, so, where, you, where, where was it again? On, on, uh, in Avon on Sunday Street? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Where, 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 where? On, on the yeah. On first. Where the yeah. centre used to was for yeah. a long time. For a long time, yes. yes, yes. Um, I can't remember the actual number, but they 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 uh, we used it quite a lot for uh, courses for schools when it was at the uh, I think they got quite a bit from it because I say you have this very immediate low level interaction with it and I say software development was very much a question of say step by step one or two little points there uh, I've written a simulator for this by the way if anybody wants to have a go at programming in which machine code let me know and I'll email you a copy of the simulator I'm still developing it but uh, there was enough there You'd have quite a bit of fun about it. fun if you put the program together and get, 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 get it running. Appreciate the feedback. One thing, uh, interesting point about the witch. Unlike a lot of, lot of computers of this age, to do arithmetic on most early computers, you have uh, you have to move both operands into a part of the computer called the mill uh, in traditional computer parlance. Be aware that arithmetic was actually done. Uh, it did the arithmetic and then you moved the result back to a storage location. In which you didn't work like that. You could actually do the uh, addition and subtraction in memory. You didn't need to go through the central process of things. A uh, one snag uh, that caught me out when I started uh, writing a few simulated programs for simulated was there is no facility in the which for actually storing a number in a memory location. All you can do is add it to a memory location. So if you all want to do, all you want to do is actually store the number, you first of all got to clear the receiving location down to zero. Otherwise you just end up adding it on top of what's already there. And until I remember that, I think it would be a bit confusing. Um, what else was the difference? Uh, perhaps the other biggest difference between the witch and the more modern computer, the one that struck me most thinking about, it, is the witch had, uh, although it had the basic the basic things you need for a jury machine. Uh, one important feature it didn't have, and that was the notion of subroutine. Although there's a talk about subroutine tapes at one stage there, they weren't really subroutine in the sense we understand them, because there was no way in the which of saying, okay, we came to this piece of code from such and such a location, let's go back to where we came from, uh, called storing the return address, which is what you need for a, sub for a subroutine. Once you've got that, you can have libraries of uh, subroutines and so on and so forth. Which didn't have that. It didn't strike me as a problem at the time. Only recently it struck me that's perhaps a um, perhaps a significant difference between that and uh, uh, and uh, more mo more modern machines. Uh, Righty hell, I think that's. Uh, uh, I hope I've not taken up too much of people's time. I'm sure want to ask just a few questions. The, the subroutine one is a workaround in the notes from Harwell that tell me how to get around that. There's, there's, there's two other gems we haven't found. One is. Um, ATV did a recording for the news uh, when Peter was in, when the machine was taken away from here. So it would be nice to track that down. And also the um, Birmingham Museums came and filmed the machine as well before it was taken off to the um, museum. And that we were hoping to try and find, and that would be absolutely super to find that as well. Thank you very much.
Uh, I've got to pick my wife up a pub, just after nine o'clock, but so, yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Anyway, I think that's really fascinating, I've certainly learned a lot, so I hope everyone else has. Well, by all means, um, I'm saying the machine is, is being restored on show. So if you're there at the museum on Wednesdays and uh, sorry, Thursdays and Saturdays, you'll see the team actually working on the machine. And as more and more of the machine is actually coming to life as well, they'll be more than pleased to show you it. So, thank you very much. If anybody wants a copy of the uh, simulated program, just, just, just let me know through Mary or or, 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 or Oh, yeah. There's well. yeah, quite a lot more to writing a simulator of historic compute. Yeah. Well, a historic compute that meets the eye. It's not quite as simple as you might think. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 perfect for next talk. <laughs> so, this is the last talk in the, this, this year's series, but we will be starting again back in sort of October, November. So, keep an eye on our website or we we'll send that messages. Okay, well, thanks again for coming and uh, safe journey home. Can I just say.